Can we give the Lord a mighty hand clap of praise? Amen. I know that during this time we are preparing for exams. It's a very stressful time. Um, but I want to assure you that we serve a powerful God who is working. Amen. Can I hear an amen? We serve a God, an amazing God, and today we want to we want to lift him up together. All right? So if you know the words, you sing with us. Hey, 
next song, I'm sure you know it. Make sure you get some room for dancing. Amen? Yeah? Are you ready? Let me hear you. Let's move like this. Let me see you clap those hands to Jesus. Hey, are you ready? Atawali, Atawali, what Jesus, Atawali. Atawale, atawale, what ye yesu, atawale, I can't hear you. Let's sing a little bit louder. Atawale, atawale, what ye yesu, atawale. Let's sing it in English. Come and reign, Lord, come and reign, for the glory is yours. Come and reign, come and reign, come and reign, Lord, come and reign, for the glory is yours. Come and reign, Lord. Let me hear you. Abuga, hey Abuga, yes, to be mulekede. Abifuge. All right, everyone, let's go like this. Because he's glorious and he's worthy of the praise. Amen. Let's sing Atawale together. Atawale. Atawale, what ye is with you? Atawale, sing Atawale, what ye is yes you? Atawale, Atawale, one more time, let's go like this. Because it's glorious, and we want Him to reign in our lives. I'm ready for one more move. This one, you need some space. I'm ready. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Chapter 3, we are told to trust God with all our heart and lean not unto our own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He'll direct your path. You could be here and you're like me, stressed and 
scared about exams, losing weight, not sleeping. This afternoon, I'm calling you to trust a God who is not limited by your power and my power. He does not depend on us, but we depend on him. So I'm calling on you this afternoon to talk to him and surrender to him all the things, all these cost units that are giving you a hard time. If it's fees, I'm calling on you to trust God. If it's your health, trust God for every situation in your life because he is our strength and he is our hope. Lord, this afternoon we trust you with all that we are. We trust you with our health. We trust you with our finances. We trust you with academics. We trust you with our finances, knowing that you have done it before us. You've not brought us this far to leave us here. So we choose to trust you this afternoon, Lord, because there is nothing you cannot do, God. Give us wisdom. Give us strength, oh God. Even as we approach exams, Lord, we choose to trust you because you are powerful, God. You are mighty, God, and there is nothing you cannot do.
The psalmist say the steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be cast headlong, for the Lord upholds his hand. He continues to say, I have been young and now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, or his children begging for bread. He is ever lending generously and his children become a blessing. Lord, as we come to you this afternoon, we have that assurance that they that trust in you would never be put to shame. So we are bold to sing, you are my strength, strength like no other. You are my hope, hope like no other. You are the Lord, our unfailing strength, stronger than mountains and deeper than oceans. Some of us draw to you this afternoon feebly, weary and afraid yet because of your character the reliability of your promises we can come to you we know you will help us we know you will answer us we know you will heal us we know you will empower us we know you lead us as we face our immediate future you are the lord our strength strength like no other and so we pray that by the ministration of your spirit, let your peace rule and reign over us, even as we continue with this service. This we pray in Jesus' name. Let us share in the prayer the Lord Jesus Christ taught us saying together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily food. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to sit quietly as we continue in prayer. And our sister Robina will lead us in a time of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thanksgiving. We continue in your presence, believing and trusting that you are faithful Lord and Savior. This afternoon, we commit our community of UCU. In this bottleneck season, we behave of activities on behalf of both staff and students. We trust and pray that you lead us, that you guide us. We pray specifically for people who have not yet committed 100% of their tuition, believing in you, our Father and Provider, that you comfort them and work through their guardians and parents so that no one will miss exam. We are committing our staff, especially those who are in very busy offices, that Lord, you are the one who appointed them there, especially to serve people even when they are worried and in fear. Father, we pray that you remind them of the stewardship role in that office, in those offices they are holding, and enable them to work in a way that glorifies you, even amid these busy schedules. We commit the sick among us. We pray that to continue comforting and healing Mama Dorothy, and committing those of her family that, Father, you will speak to them in words beyond human understanding, and they'll hear from you and be comforted by the Holy Spirit. In this, special, in this very season, there are many diseases and attacks that come upon students. Father, we pray for your healing. You heal the sick students as they go for exams and protect us from all other evil. So that as we, go, we carry on through the remaining weeks of exam, we shall finish successfully and glorify your name. We commit your church to you. Father, in this Easter season, you have been reminded that the prime reason of Christianity 
and the role of Christians is to make it known beyond in all nations that Father, you died for us and you resurrected. And that is the, ro the core of role of every Christian Lord. Equip us in our season and time that no soul will get lost, O oh Lord, and we shall take that beyond horizons to make you known and we see everyone benefiting the fruits of Christianity like you intended to, Lord, when you came on this world. Commit our nation to you, trusting that leadership comes from you. Father, we pray for the leaders you have appointed for us this season and time, that you work within them and through them as they make decisions that affect us as a nation and all other nations, Lord. You are the Lord God of all authority. We pray for your wisdom. Your word tells us in the book of Proverbs 9, 11, that knowledge of you adds us years and adds us life. Father, we are praying for your knowledge, knowledge and understanding of you upon our leaders, upon decision makers, all legislators, that all what they are doing, Father, will future you and your will, and your people will have peace. We pray against every evil and every decision that make people to doubt whether there is good. But we believe that you are there, heaven and earth belongs to you, and pray always that your will be done right from our lives and journey of Christianity and everywhere in our works, in our words, and all what we live for. We pray all this believing in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. You are very, very welcome to this service. I'm going to ask that you turn to your neighbor and tell them that the God who has brought you this far will carry you to the end. Now, don't say it like an unbeliever. Tell another person <laughs> that God who has brought you this far will carry you to the end. Mm. God is not going to abandon us. He is faithful. Is the God who begins something and completes it. Blessed be his holy name. Let us appreciate the choir for leading us in a time of worship. I have a few notices for our attention. First is a reminder that Saturday we'll have the Save the Mothers conference happening here beginning at 10 a.m. Those who have been invited to attend, please keep time. Secondly, there is a new chapter which is being launched tomorrow. It's called Africa Kwetu Students Organization. Africa Kwetu Students Organization. It has something to do with uh, raising awareness among students for East African community. It will be launched tomorrow here, and uh, the right Honorable Rebecca Kadaga has been invited to be the keynote speaker. It will run from 8 to 2 p.m. here in Nkoyoyo. Thirdly, I wish to invite Mr. Mgawe to come and do something very, very important for us as a community. Good afternoon and praise the Lord. Are you glad you're in the house of the Lord? Then say amen. amen. Yes, we are glad to have uh, our former vice chancellor here. Uh, Dr. Reverend Dr. John Senyonyi, you're welcome. It's good to have you again. Uh, thank you for loving us. Thank you for continuing to minister in our midst. You're welcome. Uh, but today we do have uh, a special recognition. We have someone who has lived amongst us for years. She has served and served diligently she has smiled to each of us. She never bypasses anybody without a smile. 
whether she knows your name, dance your name, she will gesture that she has seen you. And she has worked with a very important program to us, a program that has allowed a partnership that started years ago to grow and to nurture it. She also directed that program through the difficult period of COVID-19. When we all know that period, some programs closed and many institutions even to date are not running those programs. But she navigated it through even that difficult time. And we've seen growth in the post COVID period. I would like to welcome Rachel Robinson. Rachel speaks some Swahili. But before uh, Rachel has served under the Uganda Studies program, uh, she's coordinated that program. When we see all the USP students come in, there's a lot of hard work that goes into that. To be able to speak to the USP students to come and have an experience here takes a lot of questions, answering, and prayer. And even some come here and do struggle and you've got to work with them to see that their stay here is comfortable. And we've had many who have gone and have returned and have joined the staff team. That means that there's something good that is going on, isn't it? So let us celebrate Rachel. <laughs> She's opened herself to new challenges and I believe the Lord is going to bless her mightily in what she's going to do. So I'd like to ask her just a few words to us uh, before we do something for her. <laughs> Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> All I'll say is that it has been the joy of my life, um, this job and this work, and to be present in this community. So thank you so much. I'd like to, to give her a gesture of our love. It doesn't equate to what you've done for the commitment, the hard work. But when you look at it, just remember that we appreciate and we treasure the time that you spent with us. It reads, and it's coming from the Directorate of Research, Partnership and Innovation, Appreciation Award presented to Rachel Lewis Robinson for your distinguished service to UCU through Uganda Studies Program. We say thank you, Asante Sana. Uh, just two, two pieces of information. Uh, one is that uh, our examinations are around the corner and uh, we are making arrangements to see that we assist students to clear as soon as possible. So just to encourage our students who have not yet cleared for this semester's fees, uh, please do in good time so that we don't go through the crisis moment during the examinations. And we'll pray that uh, you succeed in your examinations Secondly is uh, we did open up our deadline for new applicants. So if you have students who are still applying, please tell them that we're still receiving the applications. So we did open that up as well. But I'll ask the chaplain to bless Rachel before we say the prayer. Thank you. Let us appreciate Mr. Mgawe. I actually want to ask that all the students on the Uganda study program, please do come in front. We want to pray for you. We know that somewhere between now and next semester, we might not see you. I want to bless you as you go back to your communities. Rachel, will you come 
and Emily, please do come. We want to pray for you as well. Let us reach our right hand of blessing towards these wonderful. God, our heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the gift of Christian community. We thank you for the way you bring us together for your holy purposes. We thank you for the ministry that Rachel has done in our midst. We thank you for her witness. We thank you that through her you have loved us. Also thank you for our brothers and sisters you brought this semester from other universities in the USA to join us and be part of this community. Lord, as they finish their time with us, we pray that you will send them off with your blessing. Go ahead of them, especially as they rejoin their communities. Help them with transitioning and adjusting. We pray that everything you have taught them while at UCU, they will be able to teach others as we continue to propagate your kingdom. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God's blessing. Amen. Yellow fever vaccination will take place on Saturday and Sunday. If you have not yet gotten the shot, be sure to get the shot. After this week, you might have to part with money to get the same shot. It's now available and free. A preacher this afternoon has been mentioned, the Reverend Canon Dr. John Senyonyi. I was telling him that he seems to be more busy than me, who is not retired. But it's always a joy to have you, sir. Bring God's word. And we trust that God will use you to speak to us. Get your Bibles now, and we'll turn to the reading of the scripture. And our sister Tendo will lead us in the reading of the passage. Praise the Lord. Our reading this afternoon is taken from Paul's letter to Ephesians, chapter 4, from verse 11. Ephesians chapter 4 from verse 11. It reads, Christ chose some of us to be apostles, prophets, missionaries, pastors, and teachers, so that his people would learn to serve and his body would grow strong. This will continue until we are united by our faith and by our understanding of the Son of God. Then we will be mature just as Christ is, and we will be completely like him. We must stop acting like children. We must not let deceitful people trick us by their false teachings, which are like winds that toss us around from place to place. Love should always make us tell the truth. Then we will grow in every way and be more like Christ, the head. Of the body, Christ holds it together and makes all of its parts work perfectly as it grows and becomes strong because of love. This is the word of God. Hello? Ah, good. I'm connected. But otherwise, for me, I can always speak even without a sound system. I have done that in a much larger church than this, but it's good to have this system. Thank you very much, Chaplain. Thank you, Deputy Vice Chancellor, for welcoming me back home, I should say, because I spent my family and I spent 20 years in this place. And uh, we are truly, truly thankful. Uh, my wife would have been with me, but you said it right. 
busy, busy, busy. As I speak right now, she's probably moving from one meeting to another meeting, and I'm also going for another meeting. So this is the kind of life that we live today, uh, but it's very exciting to know that we are not idle. Uh, but uh, thank you very much for welcoming us. And it's a joy for me to be here when uh, my sister Rachel is being bid bye-bye. So special. You know, the chaplain mentioned COVID. Her parents were here. She was here. And you know, that was a very, very testing time. So thank you for your service. If I may add a word to what has already been said by both the DVC and the chaplain. And may God bless you as you proceed to your next assignment. Well, uh, my wife did send her greetings. My, I have one wife. And I have been with her for, we are celebrating next week 39 years. And uh, when you see her, she still looks as young as when we got married. You should thank me. <laughs> uh, and God blessed us with four children. All of them are adults, as you can imagine. Uh, we have one girl. She's married with four children. Uh, three boys, two of them are married. One of them has... Uh, two children, and he's in the UK. As a matter of fact, we are going to be visiting them shortly. And then another one has one child. So we've got seven grandchildren. And that, you know, uh, anyone who has grandchildren, I know the majority of you don't understand what I'm talking about. But uh, it's a very, very special thing. But what a joy for me to be here again. I was given a topic coming out of the text that was read for us. And the topic says, beware of the onslaught of secularism. Secularism. Now, of course, the word secularism does not exist in the Bible. It's just not there. You won't find it there. But as we talk about it, Definitely, there's some implications in the text that we have. But I want us, first of all, to understand secularism. And speaking honestly, I don't think I can exhaust it. Secularism is a subject that I think could be discussed over hours. And Christians need to take particular interest in understanding what is happening in the world. There's a lot that has grown out of a secular mindset, a secular worldview. But very simply, most people define it this way, that is the principle of conducting human affairs based on naturalistic considerations without involving religion. In other words, secularism, the first thing that it does is to reject the notion of submitting to God or the authority of God or the word of God so that we can actually look at these things from a naturalistic view. And if you wish, these are some of the things that has happened eventually ending up in many constitutions around the world, including ours. Talking about the separation of state and religion. Now that sounds okay until you realize what it has done in a number of nations. I think for our friends in the U.S., they understand that. You separate state and religion, and then state starts dictating about religion. That's what normally happens. And those are secularistic tendencies that we need to be aware of. But secularism, as the, no, as the name goes, is an ism. I don't know if you know what an ism is. It's an ideology that rejects the involvement and influence of religion in ordinary social affairs or even the political activities of the country. Now, this is supposed to result in religious neutrality, but the truth is secularism tends to be antagonistic to religion, but particularly antagonistic to Christianity. 
That's what I seem to observe almost everywhere. Should ordinarily be resulting in the religious neutrality of the state, where you have equality of all citizens, freedom of conscience, and freedom of religion. That sounds great. That sounds good. And as Christians, I think we need to affirm those. So on the face of this, on the face of it, it should be protecting us to worship our God without the interference of the state. So it sounds harmless that far. Moreover, secularism has got a number of things that people, secularists, would normally believe that seem to be agreeable to us as Christians. But let's understand this, that secularism is a humanistic ideology. It's a humanistic ideology which puts everything subject to human impulses and whatever human beings decide. Now, I'm not giving an academic lecture. I'm going to come back to the scriptures because that's exactly what we want to learn. But I want us to have a little appreciation of what secularism is all about. In fact, what secularism does is to make you a god. It just makes you a god as a human being. That you are at the center, you are determining what is good. You don't need God to do that. You can do it on your own. And for that reason, it never glorifies God. But builds a kind of utopia, or at least anticipates a kind of utopia, of social harmonious coexistence for us all. Now, if it was successful, then our world would be the most peaceful. But the truth of the matter is it isn't. And secularism has caused more heartaches, more problems that I do not even have the time to talk about now. But it often markets itself as the most tolerant. Now you can understand that because as a Christian, we hold to truths exclusively. When I say that Jesus is Lord, I'm saying that there is no other who is Lord. And so for that reason, you start getting a clash between Christianity and secularism. And secular thinking, you know, spreads with a lot of subtlety. It's quite insidious. Stealthily spreading. And it's very patient, I have to say. Okay. Just yesterday, I was talking to some university students. And uh, this is a virtual thing. We speak virtually every week, my wife and I. Either I speak or she speaks. And I was speaking about the, I was speaking on the topic result-oriented. That's the topic I was given. Now, result-oriented, when you go into the definitions that are given, to put it very simply, it's more concerned about the end. Don't worry too much about the means, how you get there. You can bend the rules as much as you want, as long as you achieve. Now, these are, this is a Christian institution I was speaking to. And you never get to realize the danger that is in that kind of language. Because that's how result-oriented is actually defined. But in the end of it, you find yourself actually face to face with a secular worldview. Or take, for example, I'm sure all of you have heard of human rights. <laughs> How do we, you know, originally human rights were inalienable, they were intrinsic to the human being, they were general to all. Those would be the human rights. That's how they were first described. Today, if a hundred of us decided this is who we are, and I think you know what I mean, it's a human right. You see, that's what secularism is actually doing to society. And somehow we think that we can live without God. Let me begin, first of all, by taking you to what 
Jesus says in John chapter 17, in the few minutes we have. Jesus says to us as Christians, you are in the world, but you are not of the world. Now, what does he actually mean? And he says it repeatedly, particularly in chapter 17. He says it in verse 6. Let me read that for you. I've manifested my na your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. You notice that emphasis? Out of the world. Then in verse 11, he says, and I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name. Verse 14, he says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. They are in the world, but they are not of the world. And something similar is said in verse 16, but let me jump to verse 18. Verse 18 says, as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. He's not sending us into the world to become part and parcel of the world, to think like the world, to do things the way the world does them. So Jesus emphasizes this truth about every Christian, that you as a Christian, while you are in the world, you are not of the world. What does that mean? My understanding of in the world connotes that, the, that as we live in the world, we are prone to the influence of the world. It's possible for the world to start changing us, to influence us, and to give us his thinking, and to give us his worldview. And that's the reason why every Christian needs to be aware and careful how we assess the world. And the churches have slid very quickly. When did you last hear a sermon on salvation from sin, not salvation as giving you a good life? Isn't that what is preached today? People no longer talk about sin. And yet the Bible is categorical. Christ Jesus came into the world to do what? To save sinners. He never came here to give me good health. He never came here to make me wealthy. He came here to save sinners. But those are some ones you won't hear. We no longer talk about sin. Just the other day I was talking to a lady and I was sharing with her about Christ. And she was telling me that she was already a locally. You know, we love that. We are saved. I got saved when I was young. And in the course of conversation, I found out she is cohabiting with a man. And she sees no contradiction between the two. That's the world we live in. You see, secularism has removed God from center. And therefore, we are able to determine what is right and what is good. And don't say that it's only in the Western world. It is here. And sadly, pastors are spreading it just as fast. In fact, even faster than the government or any of the others. So Jesus says you are in the world. It's possible that you'll be influenced. Listen, friends, and I've said this to the church of Uganda. The government pushes us to talk about development. And they are right. The government is right. I'm not going to say no. But is that the core of our message? I am an evangelist. So for me, when I preach, I preach about sin. And I want people to be saved. I want them to live sin. I want them to hate sin. But you know what? So we also as a church start talking. So you hear different clergymen, whether it's Church of Uganda or other pastors, that we are beginning projects of development as if that is the salvation of the people. Where is that coming from? Because we are listening to voices that are not telling. When Jesus says we are not of the world, he's talking about a spiritual and cultural citizenship. Spiritual and cultural citizenship. 
That's why Paul says in Philippians 3.20, but our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That is our citizenship. Yes, we do have a dual citizenship and St. Augustine writes about that, this, the cities of God, the city of God. But we must understand that when the Bible says we are not of the world, it is saying that your spiritual allegiance, your spiritual loyalty, your cultural loyalty is in not here. It's in heaven. Now, what does that actually mean? You know, let me just take culture, for example. Many years ago, I happened to be in Australia. And we were in a shop, a very small shop. And there was a white man right behind me. And I was with another friend and we were speaking Luganda. No, 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 actually we were speaking English. We, we were speaking English, if I remember correctly. And this man said to us, are you from Uganda? And we said, yes, we are. He himself was from New Zealand, and we found out he had actually lived in Uganda for many years. But now, of course, he lived in New Zealand. You see, friends, culture passes on to us many more things than we realize. When I listen to Ugandan speaking, quite often I can tell that persons from Buganda, especially when they struggle with the R, and that person is from the West if they struggle with the L. That person is from the North if they are struggling with the Z or Z. Do you see what I mean? Friends, what is saying that the citizenship in heaven is that our language must be the language of heaven. Culturally, that's where we belong. That we are able to see the world as Jesus saw it. I like the little book. And again, I was speaking about it elsewhere. Little book called In His Steps, which was written in the 19th century by Charles Sheldon. And from it, there came a kind of fad, a kind of phrase. What would Jesus do? And citizenship in heaven means that you see this world from God's perspective and it's like you're asking yourself, what would Jesus do? What would he do? Not would, what would the pastor do? Not what does the government want me to do? But you see yourself as a citizen of heaven first and foremost. And it's that citizenship that then has impact on how you live in the world. And what Paul is telling us and what Jesus is actually saying when he calls, he says we are not of the world, he's actually saying to us that we must conduct ourselves as heavenly residents, even in this world. Living for what is eternal rather than for what is transient. Judge everything from a Christian worldview. You need to be able to sit, look at whatever is happening and think about it from a Christian worldview. If I were to ask most Christians, as I asked in fact that lady that I was talking about when she said that she's saved, I asked her, what is the gospel? She actually was blank. She could not even express it. What is the gospel? And if I were to ask you, you are university people, you are a lot more literate. This lady is not that literate. What is the gospel? Do you know what it is? Do you know the demands that it places upon you? So we come down to the text that was read for us, and I just want to conclude with that. You see, in verse 14, and I just want us to look at that verse 14, and then I read it for you. It says, just chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, this is what it says. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. 
Now, three things that I want to say to you from that concerning this ism called secularism. But of course, as I talk about secularism, we are saying that all the other isms tend to follow exactly the same. That's what Paul is saying. One, in this world, there will be many waves and winds that attack the Christian. Don't ever think that somehow we are here to make peace with the world. If we have peace with the world, let's have it on the terms of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not on the terms of the world. So there will be many waves, there will be many teachings. In fact, these days, I remember when I came here in 2001, the environment here was extremely different. But as, as I drive, because we live just here in Mukono anyway. As I drive and I'm passing through the roads that are near the university, I find so many churches that have been planted. No doubt some of them are speaking the truth, but some of them, I have my doubts. Waves and winds. You need to be aware of that. So that's the first thing he says. Secondly, he says that the isms are manufactured by humans. Secularism is, but they are taught convincingly. They are very shrewd. Paul uses the word cunning. That's what my translation uses. They are very cunning. When you listen to them, everything sounds very convincing. After all, who doesn't want to be empowered to be what they want? But say a doctrine of human beings. Now, nobody ever teaches a doctrine unconvincingly. If you can keep that in mind. Nobody. I cannot be here to teach things that you cannot be convinced about. I want to make sure that I present it in such a way that by the time I'm done, you believe what I am. But for me, my purpose is God's word. And he says it is human doctrine. But thirdly, He's saying to us that whatever does not lead us to Christ is a lie. He calls them deceitful schemes. Whatever does not exalt Jesus, whatever does not glorify him, whatever does not show him to be the savior of the world, whatever does not show him as the one through whom and exclusively the only one through whom we find forgiveness of sins is a deceitful scheme. You may be better, things may be well, but what actually we are reading here is that there are deceitful schemes that are going to deceive us. Okay. Then Paul goes on in that passage that we read, and he talks about the goal that has been set for God's church, for God's saints, for you and me who believe in Christ. That yes, there is secularism. Yes, there are going to be other kinds of teachings. What are we supposed to do? And he says there is a goal. And I'm going to say four things here. One, that all his saints will be in the ministry wherever they are placed. It does not matter what you are. It does not matter what you do. You may be a lawyer. You may be a teacher. You know, sometimes we tend to think that ministry is what those who are called but I want you to understand that wherever you are, you are doing the ministry of God. And that's why he says in verse 12, listen to this. He says to equip the saints for the work of ministry. That's no matter what you do. My first degrees actually were in mathematics. And when I'm teaching mathematics, do I teach it the way God would want me to teach? It can be education. That you are studying education. Are you doing it as a ministry to the students? It doesn't matter what it is. Including just your normal, ordinary occupations in the dormitory or wherever you may be walking. All of those come back to the same thing. Two. That his saints will believe alike. 
be of one faith in the one Lord. Verse 13, what does he say? Until we all attain to the unit of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood. Believe alike. So I ask you the question, is Christ your sole object of faith? Or do you believe in Christ and you also believe in the pastor? You know, many people, when we enter churches, we switch off. You believe in Christ, but you're also believing in a number of other isms. Do you know the Son of God and are you growing in that knowledge? Because what he wants is for you to grow to the fullness of Christ. I like what someone said to me when I came to Christ almost 48 years ago. Say to me, a mature Christian is a growing Christian. Even for me now. I'm still growing in Christ. I'm still cherishing to be more in Christ. I want to know him more and more and more and more. And that is something that Paul expresses in chapter 3, even if I don't read it, but you can see, you can see it for yourself. I want to know him more and more each day, each moment. That's what maturity is all about. But thirdly, he says in verse 14 that his saints may be mature, established and stable. That's what it means. Established and stable. That you are firm in your faith, not swayed by every teaching that comes your way. You should be able to judge what teaching is godly and what teaching is ungodly. You should be established. Oh, this is an age where Christians have become nomadic. There's so many nomads in the churches. They are moving this way, they are moving that way, they are being taught nonsense and stupidity. They are just on the run all the time. And Paul is saying you should be established. Listen to verse 14. He says, and I read it before, he says, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried by every wind of doctrine. Established, firm, stable. That's what it is. When I came to Christ in 1976 as a university student, I was shown many churches. Many. <laughs> and I have no problem with the churches. I've worked and I continue to work with many different churches as long as they uphold the Christ as the Lord of all. I have no problem with that. But I was shown many. But eventually, you see, because when I came to Christ, in my memory, I remembered that the reason why I came to Christ is because of the saved people that I saw as a child in my own church. They were telling me there are no saved people in the Anglican church. But then I had seen them. In fact, their life was more exemplary than the life I was seeing among those who were telling me to move out. And I said, uh-uh. Now that was me. I'm just giving you my testimony. I'm not saying that for you, you cannot choose elsewhere. But I'm just saying to you that you see, friends, God never saves us to become nomads. Stable, established. Settle in one place. When I have been out, I've attended other churches. When I was in Australia, I was attending a church called Church of Christ, which is like a Baptist church. And then in the latter years, then I attended also the Anglican Church. When I was in the U.S. for three years, we attended a Presbyterian church. I have no problem with it. I can attend these churches. As long as they are holding to the lordship of our Lord Jesus Christ and they're preaching the gospel of salvation that I know from Scripture. I am established. I am stable. I'm not going to move. Even if you tell me, oh, Jesus is coming over there, I'm not moving. And finally, he says in verse 15 that saints, oh, I have two more points, that saints will know God's truth and speak it in love. Do you know the truth about the gospel of Christ? I already asked that question. Do you know actually what you believe? Don't get go. A professor at the theological school I attended in the U.S., Paul Little, he wrote a book, Know Why and What You Believe. 
You must know. You must know. What do you believe? Why do you believe it? Every Christian should do this. And the final one is the glory of Jesus Christ our head is our goal. I want to glorify Jesus. No other. I want to glorify you. Not a pastor. Nothing. If he gives me, I will take. If he doesn't give me and others are giving me and it's not coming from him, I would rather not. Friends, that's what he's saying. So do you live to glorify Jesus Christ as your head? Or are you, as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter, particularly chapter 3, where he talks about some Christians who are worldly, or the word that we used to use before was carnal, people of the flesh, that whatever satisfies my passions, that which makes me happy is, what, is how I walk. How exactly are you walking? Friends, the only way that you will be able to overcome, the only way you will be able to resist the onslaught of secularism is if you yourself are well established in your faith. Nobody is going to move around protecting you. If you go into other countries, the West is very secularized right now. And if you go there, you better be firm. But there are believers there who are standing. Why? Because they know who they have believed. That's why the song used to be sung, I know whom I have believed. And I know. May God bless you. Let us appreciate Dr. Sidney one more time. <laughs> praise the Lord. Tell your neighbor whether you say praise the Lord or praise the Lord, it's all right. Celebration of cultures. Powerful, powerful thought. Now tell another neighbor you are not a God. Don't believe that you are not a God. One more thought to share. Tell your neighbor you are in the world, but are you of the world? Yeah. Let us stand together. Shall we bow for a word of prayer? God, our heavenly Father, we stand in honor of your word. Proclaim to us by your servant, Reverend Canon Dr. John Senyon. Thank you for the things that you call our attention to, especially with regard to the onslaught of secularism. Lord, many times these winds, these waves, have come to us and caught us unawares because we didn't have what it takes to stand up against them. Thank you for the challenge this afternoon to be grounded in the word, to have a firm grasp of the message of the gospel and to live after the gospel. Thank you for your word to us from Ephesians chapter 4. All those five principles you call us to help us, dear Lord, to hold on to them. I also commit to you our brothers and sisters, as they head for their examinations next week, that, Lord our God, the spirit of wisdom will rest upon them, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of remembrance. Empower them, enabled by your Holy Spirit. I also pray for these ones who are here, those online, and everyone who will hear this message, that you'll keep them from the temptation of cheating in exams. Help us to be witnesses even when we are tried and tested with 
and by exams. So Lord, as we go, we ask that you dismiss us with your blessing. Beloved in God, the Lord bless you, the Lord keep you, the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you. And the blessing of God Almighty, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest upon each one of us. Rest upon her friends as they later Lord return to the USA. That blessing remain with us now and forever. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.